Good afternoon and welcome to Design Master Training. My name is David Robison. Today we are going to be taking a look at the circuit edit command in our electrical software for Revit. If you are attending the training live, you can ask questions in the chat box. If you're watching a recording of the training, you can call or email your questions. Our phone number is 866-516-9497 and our email address is support at designmaster.biz. So today we are looking at the circuit edit command. So if I uh, go to Revit here and I go to our DM electrical ribbon, we have the circuit edit command here. When you run that command, it pulls up the circuit edit window that looks a little bit like this. On the left hand side, you have your panels listed. In the center, you have the list of circuits on that panel. And then on the right hand side for the selected circuit, you have information about that circuit being displayed. So if I select this CTP panel that has a, a brand circuit, we've got some circuit information being displayed there. First thing I wanna highlight is what actually happens when you run this command. So if you just run the command, it pulls up all of your panels. It has the first one selected by default. Uh, and that's how you kind of come into the command. You can actually come into the command in slightly different ways, depending on what you have selected in your project. So if you select a panel on your single line diagram and you run the circuit edit command, it's gonna actually open up that panel for you. So it'll pull up just that panel and it'll have the first circuit selected. So you can see the circuits on that panel. If you need to see the other panels, we do have this load panels button. You can press that and that if it loaded just one panel, it'll load the rest of the panels in the tree for you. So you can go select them. If we go find a panel on the uh, plan view, we've got this panel here. Uh, in the plan view and the same thing if we have that selected and we run the circuit edit command it's going to select that panel for us if you select a device it's actually going to open up that specific circuit for you so if i go to my uh, 3d view and i select this cooling tower and we run the circuit edit command it's going to open up that panel and then that circuit for us uh, it's not as interesting here because there's only one circuit on that panel uh, say I go to one of these receptacles, and who knows what circuit that's on. If we run DM electrical and we run the circuit command, it's going to pull up, okay, it's on PP1A, circuit 5. And now we can start working on that circuit, uh, making any changes that you need to do. So you can get to that circuit just by selecting the device and running the circuit edit command. Same thing if you have a schedule. If you have a, a schedule of equipment or anything, and you select a piece of equipment from that schedule, and you run the circuit edit command, it's going to open up the circuit edit with that circuit selected again. So we can see that that piece of equipment is on circuit 26 for EP2. And finally, if you have a panel schedule open, it will open up the circuit edit command to this panel. Revit doesn't actually know which circuit is selected. So if you're kind of looking at the circuit here, say circuit seven, and then you run the circuit edit command, Revit doesn't know that circuit seven was selected, so we can't highlight it for you. So we'll just open up the panel and then you can go track down circuit seven or whatever you're looking at. So just in terms of opening the command, uh, what you have highlighted is gonna help uh, guide what's gonna be open by default. Just a little bit of a, a, a help there the software has to make it easier to track down your stuff. And also if you have something selected and we don't load this whole tree, it's slightly faster. So it'll load the command a little bit faster and get you right to what you want to look at if you have something selected before you run the command. All right, so we should leave the command open and we'll take a look at the other options, uh, other buttons we have in here. I already showed you the load panels. So if you press the load panels, again, that loads this tree if it wasn't already loaded. We also have the panel edit button. If we run panel edit, it's going to close the circuit edit and open up the panel edit with that circuit uh, with that panel selected. So there's just a way to go make changes to the panel that you're looking at separate from the circuits. And we can run circuit edit from here, go back to our circuit edit command. Then we have the highlight panel command. If we run that command, it will go find the panel either on the model or the single line diagram. 
and let you uh, show you where it is. Uh, in this case, it's in both, so it actually asks you what you want to see. So let's go see this panel on the single line diagram or the one line diagram. And here it is. So it highlights it in green, showing you where it is. We have one more button. So if we select a specific circuit, down here in the bottom right, we have the highlight circuit button. And what this will do is it'll show you all the devices that are connected to that circuit. We run that button and it's gonna say, okay, LP23, here's everything that's connected to it. So we can see that all of those light fixtures are on that circuit. So uh, that's helpful for just tracking down what you have connected in your model uh, to that circuit. So it's just a help that we have for keeping track of, of what you have going on in your model. It's helpful if you pull up someone else's project or if you haven't worked on a project in a little while and you wanna know where your stuff is, it'll help you track that down. So in the middle, we have all of the circuits listed. We, most of this information is display only. We do have the ability to change the circuit description. We're gonna take a look at that uh, at the end because there's a lot going on there. Uh, so just, we'll come back to that. But we do list the circuit number, the breaker size, the load in amps and VA, and then the specific voltage drop to that circuit. So that's being displayed. We have uh, sliders here so you can get this whole thing adjusted. Uh, if you've got a wider monitor, you can pull the whole thing out to be able to see everything. Uh, otherwise, you can just scroll back and forth so you can see the voltage drop for your circuits. Then on the right-hand side, we have the details for the specifically selected circuit. We'll walk through all of those uh, and see what those uh, are doing. If we take a look at a panel that has uh, panels below it, so say we take this MDP2, we select this circuit that's connected to MP2B. For the circuit details, it shows you the wire size, and then it says, if you wanna make any changes, go make those changes in the panel itself. Uh, so when we're looking at circuit details, those are really for branch circuit settings. For feeder settings where you're connected to another piece of equipment, you run panel edit and you go make the changes here in the feeder section. So if you wanted to change how that panel was being fed, you change it here. We kind of keep the feeder as something that you think about relative to the panel rather than in the, the, the circuit that it's connected to. So that's just how we have that set up. These are where you make all those changes. And that's one of the reasons we have that panel edit button so that you can get over here quickly when you need to. Scott's asking, when you highlight a circuit, does it give you the option to find the devices on different views? No, it's just going to find it on a view and show it to you. So basically the way that works is Revit has a built-in function to highlight something. And so we just call that and say, Revit, can you highlight what this is? So we don't have a whole lot of control over where it's showing it to you. I believe it's going to prefer any views that are currently open. So if you have some floor plan views open, it's gonna go find it there. If, if there's nothing open, it, it, uh, it then displays a, a message saying, hey, there's no views open. Do you want me to try and find a view where I can find it? And then it kind of goes searching for one. First one it finds, then it shows it to you. Uh, so if I click highlight circuit here again, yeah, there, there's really no options. It's just saying, this is where it is. I'm just, this is where I found it. We do have the option for the, um, I believe if you had it on the, single line diagram, we might prompt for those. So the CTP is on our single line. Uh, so we'll prompt for model or the single line. But if you're selecting model, it's just gonna show it somewhere. Revit doesn't have great reporting for us uh, on where in the model it is. So we just have to kind of hand it over to Revit and let Revit do the, uh, find it for us. Uh, so on the right-hand side, when you have the circuit selected, we, uh, if you have a branch circuit selected, we have all of the details that we can set for that circuit. Uh, up at the top, we again have all of the circuit description information, and we're gonna skip over that and then come back to it at the end, just so I can talk about all of that uh, just once at the end, because there's a lot going on there. Uh, the, the first thing we'll take a look at is the overcurrent protection trip size. By default, uh, everything is set to size automatically, so it's actually pulling the size for the overcurrent protection from elsewhere in the project. You can override that. You can set it to none if you don't want a breaker, or you can set a specific breaker size, and then it'll use that uh, for the breaker size. And if the wire is sizing automatically, it'll size the, the wire to match. 
When sizing automatically, uh, it's going to take a look at the instance and the family settings and, and determine the overcurrent protection size based on that. So we're not going to take a look at those settings. Uh, that's going to be another training where we look at the instance edit and the family edit command. But we have lots of different places in the instance and in the family where you can control that. If nothing is set there, by default, we're going to do the breaker to be 125% of the connected load. Uh, and that you know handles 80% of your circuits. That's going to get your standard lighting and receptacles. For some of your equipment, you might have other things going on in MOCP and whatnot. So you can make those changes in those other commands. Uh, we're not going to look at those right now, but that's where that's going to pull that information. Next, we have the overcurrent protection frame. So we can have a frame size separate from the trip size. By default, we're just going to match the trip, or you can override it with a specific value. Next, we display the wire size. So we give you the wire callout. And then we give you the voltage drop on the branch circuit and the fault calculated at the device. So for the fault, fault really only makes sense when you're talking about a specific device, so a, a single piece of equipment. So if you have more than three pieces of equipment on the device, on the circuit, we're not going to calculate a fault. We're just going to say it's not calculated. Uh, if it's one, two, or, or three, we actually do calculate a fault. So if it's two or three, we kind of average the distance because sometimes you'll circuit up the disconnect separate from a piece of equipment. So you'll have two devices, but it's really only one. So you still want the fault. Uh, so we have the fault. It's really intended for a single piece of equipment on a circuit. So again, if we go back to our CTP where we have our cooling tower, here's the fault at that cooling tower, uh, which is something that you might be interested in. For a piece of equipment, you might want to know what the fault is for, for making sure that the, the disconnect is rated properly. Uh, for something like you know a bunch of receptacles in an office, you, you, you're not worried about the fault uh, at your receptacles. So we don't display it, and it would have to be a different fault at each place anyway. So, so for those circuits that have multiple devices, we just say, hey, we're not calculating it. There's too many devices. If you did need the fault at those devices, you would need to model it differently. You could model this electrical equipment essentially and, and get the fault there. If you had a string of devices on a circuit where you needed the fault at each of them. After the fault, we then have the conductor size. So here's where we're actually setting the wire size used for the circuit. We have the default setting where we're sizing it based upon this selection in the wire ampacities dialog. Uh, so we're going to, by default, size it to match the trip, unless you have other settings in the instance or family edit. But in general, it's going to match the trip size. You can also choose a specific uh, wiring option. So by default, it's choosing copper. We could force it to copper, which isn't going to change anything. We could also change it to aluminum. So if we select this aluminum, it's now going to size it automatically based upon the trip, just using our aluminum wires rather than our copper wires. So you can switch back and forth. Uh, so it's still sizing it automatically, just using a different criteria. You can set it to none if you don't actually want to have a wire size at all. That just blanks the whole thing out. Or you can choose a specific wire size. And uh, so you have all those. And then the final option is that you can choose custom. When you select custom, I'm going to set it back to a wire size, but then when you select custom, it will let you put in a custom callout and custom impedances. Here's where you're typing in exactly what you want this wire uh, size to be. So if you have, you know, two common examples would be a bus gutter, probably not for branch circuits, that's more for feeders or where you have multiple parallel runs and you're putting them in a single conduit rather than separate conduits. We don't actually have a way to specify that in the software, so you have to do that with a custom callout. Uh, and then you, so you just have to do that that way. Um, and then the wires end up being derated a little bit because you got a bunch of wires in that one conduit. Uh, and then once you have that specified, you specify, uh, you, you enter the custom callout, and then you set the impedance values, the X and the R, for whatever that configuration is. And then we'll use that for our calculations. Uh, for neutral, we have the option to match the phase wire. We can do double phase. And when we do that, we actually put in two wires for the neutral. So we can do that. Or you can specify a specific neutral wire. On three phase circuits, if you double the neutral, the assumption that we have built into the software is if you're doubling the neutral, it's usually because you actually have a current ending up on that neutral. 
Uh, so that's why you're, you're upsizing it. And if you do have a current on a doubled neutral, you end up with five current carrying conductors instead of four if you have a three phase circuit. So if we go over here to CTP and we double this neutral, we're gonna end up with five wires rather than just four. And there's actually a derating that needs to happen. So when you change this to a double phase, we will derate the wire and give you something slightly larger to account for that. Uh, so just be aware that if you go from same as phase to double phase and it's a three pole circuit that you'll actually get larger wires. And then you can, again, you can choose a specific size for the neutral. We can specify the ground size automatically uh, is gonna size the ground based upon the, what, it, what it's connected to. So for branch circuits, that's always gonna be an equipment ground. Uh, we also, if you connect to uh, the utility or to a transformer, we put in a service ground. So the size automatically kind of determines those two situations for you. You can force it to use an equipment ground or a service ground. So you can say, okay, in this case, uh, you know, I generally it's gonna be an equipment, but I wanna size this one for a service ground for whatever purposes. You can specify that so it'll still size it automatically just using the different NAC tape 102 versus 122. And then you also have the option to set it to none or a specific value if you need to. Uh, with ground sizing also, we will upsize the ground if you upsize your conductors for voltage drop. So if I come back here, uh, if we go to a, a larger size breaker, it becomes more clear. If we go to a 100 amp breaker, uh, we're just going to use a number eight ground, which is the standard equipment ground for a 100 amp breaker. The uh, assumption being that uh, our conductors are being sized to match our breaker and so that we don't trigger the uh, NEC requirement to upsize the ground proportionally. If we have our default 20 amp breaker, but we need a very big wire, say we go up to number one wire, we actually are going to upsize the ground proportionally at that point. So we end up with a number one ground, which is a very large ground, but that's what the NEC requires in that case. So the ground sizing uh, varies a little bit depending on whether you're upsizing your breaker or upsizing your conductors. Uh, I'm gonna finish out the conduits and then we'll take a look at the, the conductor question I've got. So for the, uh, the conduit, we can size it automatically and it's gonna give you a 40% fill. So we'll take a look at the wires and we'll, we'll uh, make sure that we don't exceed a 40% fill. You can set it to none or you can set a specific size if you want to. And then there is a question can we set a minimum size where we don't want to use anything less than three quarters of an inch, which is you know, the most common request, which comes up all the time. A lot of people don't actually like to use half inch conduit. Uh, you can't on a specific circuit level, but you can in wire ampacities set it, uh, actually no, it's in conduit sizing, set it for the project. If you go to your conduit sizes, there's two choices. You could just delete the whole thing uh, in this case, we're actually using the EMT PVC option. So you could get rid of the half inch conduit and it's, you know, it's not, you can't choose it and you also are not gonna size to it. You can also just uncheck this box here and then you won't size to it. Uh, so that would be the, the, probably the most common way. You just uncheck that standard box. You can still choose it as an option if you want to, but the software is not gonna choose it as a size. So if we uncheck that, go back to our circuit edit command and take a look at this here. Now we have a three quarter inch conduit rather than the half inch, but we still have the option to choose the half inch conduit if we want to for a specific circuit. Uh, if you do adjust your conduit, it will recalculate that fill for you. Half inch is you know 13% and then the three quarter is 7%. So it will display that value. So if you are changing your conduit, you'll see what it is. After the conduit, we have the ambient temperature and we use this to derate the wire if you set it something off the default. So if I go from uh, 30 degrees to 45, uh, it's gonna have to upsize my wires to number 10 based upon that ambient temperature. Uh, then we have the circuit length calculation. Uh, and there is actually a lot going on here as well. So we'll take a moment and walk through all of our different options. Uh, the first question is, how are you calculating the circuit length? We can do, uh, in the software, we can do right angles where we're following the X and the Y axis of the building, uh, and then the elevation, any change in, in Z. So that's the right angle calculation. Straight line, we will do X, Y directly to the device, 
uh, kind of as the crows flies. And then if there is any, any elevation change, any Z change, we'll, we'll include that as well. We can use the Revit calculated length. That's if you're using the Revit circuit path feature, you can trace out the uh, route of the circuit, and then we'll use that for the length. Finally, we have the fixed length where you are just going to type in a number and say, okay, I know that this circuit is 50 feet long. For branch circuits, it becomes a little bit tricky. For a feeder, this is really simple because you have a single panel and it's just the distance to that panel from the other panel. For a branch circuit, you've got multiple devices. Uh, you know, if we highlight the circuit, there's the question, what is the length that we're even using? What are we gonna use that length for? Uh, you know, is there any branching happening? So what we're doing when we're doing our automatic calculations is that we are calculating the average distance. So if I do default, on average, those light fixtures are 75 feet away from the panel. And then for our uh, voltage drop calculation, we put the entire load at that average distance and calculate the voltage drop based upon that. And then for fault, we will just use the wire length and that uh, the wire size to calculate the fault. So uh, that's partly why we don't do fault to multiple devices because it kind of all falls apart. But if there's one device, uh, it, it works, and so we can calculate the fault. For uh, voltage drop, if you have a single device, it works out because the one device is, is all that's there, and so the length to that device is the entire length. It does get a little bit tricky when you have multiple devices on your circuit. Uh, we re recently released a support article that walks through how this calculation actually ends up working. So that's why I wanted to take a moment to look at uh, that and just walk you through how these calculations end up happening. So for a single device, um, We've got our panel, we've got our receptacle. In this case, uh, it's 100 feet away. It's a standard receptacle with 0.18 kVA assumed on it. Uh, and we end up with a 0.26 voltage drop. So for a single device, uh, that's what you get for the voltage drop. And so you have, if you have a single receptacle, a single piece of equipment, it's a fairly straightforward calculation and our branch circuits are gonna be spot on. When you have multiple devices is where it becomes more complicated. So if we have three of these in a line, you have the distance changing. You also have the load changing because you know it's a little bit tricky what's actually plugged into those receptacles, but assuming they each have 0.18 load on the uh, KVA on them, you know, we're going to have three times that on this first receptacle. Here we only have two times that. And by the time we get down here, there's only one receptacle worth of load. So if you do the math, you end up, you know, based upon We've got 0.26 for this one here, and then we've got double that for this part of the circuit here, uh, triple that here. And then you add all of those voltage drops up to get the total on this circuit. Uh, so that would be the way that you could, you know, the, the most precise way to do that calculation. For our branch circuits, we take the average distance. So we've got these three in a line. This is 100, 200, 300. You add all those up and they average to 200. Uh, and then you do the full load there. And in this case, it actually turns out to, to be exactly the same. So if they're in a straight line, our calculation exactly matches what you would calculate if you were doing it precisely by hand. All right, so what if we take these devices and we put a bend in them? So rather than having a straight line, we actually make a curve, uh, we make a turn. So here, you know, the, if you calculate it by hand, you get obviously the same voltage drop because while you know, we've changed this location, the distances haven't changed at all. So we get the same calculated value. In Design Master, we have 100 feet and 200 feet to these two. Uh, if we're doing a straight line calculation, it's going to do a calculation straight to this one, ends up being about 223 feet, and the average distance is 175 feet as opposed to 200 feet. So it's actually, it sees it as a shorter distance, and so we are going to end up with a smaller voltage drop. So in this case, we're, we're undercounting the voltage drop here. So it's, it's a little bit lower than it otherwise would be. Uh, these devices are spread apart, fairly distant. You know, they're 100 feet apart. Normally, you end up with a bunch of receptacles all clustered together. So the, the differences end up being minuscule in, in most cases. It's only when you have these long runs 
So it's really site lighting and things like that where this might ever come into to play. Just as another example, if you have some situation where the devices are kind of circling around the panel, again, we're going to not be as uh, precise in our calculation. Here, you know, again, same distances, just arranged differently, so the voltage drop isn't the same. The average distance from these panels, the panel to the receptacles is 92 feet, so we get a lower voltage drop, 0.72%. Uh, so that is what we're doing with our calculations of our lengths and how that then impacts the voltage drop. So as long as you're kind of in this case here where you've got them all kind of in the same direction away from the panel, it ends up working out. If they are longer runs, it might end up mattering a little bit. And then if you have cases where they're kind of circling around, that's where you're, it's going to be less precise. And you might need to go calculate those uh, separately if you're concerned about the voltage drop on a circuit like that. There's a question, uh, what's the reasoning for our default of EMT less than two inches and PVC for two and a half or greater? The reasoning is just that uh, that's what the engineers we work with have said that they generally like to specify, that uh, they prefer e EMT for the smaller circuits. When they get bigger, they, they switch over to using PVC conduit. Uh, so by default, that's how it's set up. Uh, so usually that's you know in the specification that's how it should be. So we don't we just call it out that way, uh, but we do try and make it clear in our wiring capacity that that's why it is. And if you have a mix where you have some the the, the size of the conduit isn't going to tell you exactly what the material is, the way that we have that set up in our software is that uh, choose the conduit size. We've got these defaults. This is the EMT PVC swapping. We also have specific EMT and PVC tables as well. So you could specify a specific size for the conduit and a specific material, and then it'll include it in that wire callout. So if I wanted to specify three quarter EMT, then that's being specified or three quarter PVC. It'll actually change the wire callout, then it's clear that that's what's being indicated there. There are uh, a couple other options here for circuit lengths. For the right angles, we have the angle of the building, whether it's like actually, uh, you know, X and Y, or if it's kind of off, you know, rotated. So if you're using your default, we're going to use the default building angle. If you specify that we're calculating based on right angles, you can actually change the uh, angle of the building for this circuit. So if we want to use a 45 degree offset, we could change that and we'll get a different size wire as well. or a different length wire. Then we have the wire makeup. This is additional wire length added either once to the circuit or for each device. Uh, so say, for example, you're in a warehouse and you're running your uh, circuit on the ceiling and you're dropping down to receptacles. So it's a 20 foot ceiling and you've got extra 40 feet of wire to each receptacle. You could set a wire makeup and we could say, okay, I'm going to do that for each, uh, in this case, it's light fixtures, but whatever each device on the circuit and so, you know, we've got a hugely uh, larger circuit length happening now. That's just how you can account for those additional distances. If it's not for each device, if it's just once, you know, that's maybe if, if you've got your panel in a different elevation, you're going up and then down once. So if you need to add additional length to what we calculate, that's what the wire makeup is for. And you can do it once or per device on your, uh, in your, on the circuit. If you have a fixed length and you've typed it in, if you also specify a wire makeup, we are going to add it together. So that's what this actual length ends up being. It's where we show you, okay, here's where the number you typed in. You also gave us this 40. We assume you want to use both of those numbers. So we're going to use 90, to 90 feet as the length of this circuit. All right, and now circling back to circuit descriptions. Design Master has the ability to handle circuit descriptions for you. You can also turn that off and use Revit's circuit descriptions. A lot of people have done a bunch of work prior to using our software to get circuit descriptions working and they don't want to use our system and that's fine. So you turn it off, you have Revit handle it and then you know none of this stuff applies to you. Uh, we actually disable all of these fields. So if we go into customization, we go to project options and we say, okay, let's use our Revit circuit descriptions. You run the circuit edit command 
and the circuit, you know, this is disabled, we can't change this, the description is here, and then it also tells you, hey, this is being controlled by Revit, you can't change it in this command anymore. And then we have our different options for your circuit descriptions at the circuit level. You can also make changes in the instance and in the family for these. We'll be talking about those commands in future trainings, so you can look at those. There's also a recording from 2019, I believe, where I talk about just circuit descriptions, where I go over all of the options. So if you want to know what you can set at the instance and family level, you can go watch that training. Uh, but for the circuit, we're going to pull the default value from the instance and the family and give you that description. And then we give you options at the circuit level to make some changes. You can add a prefix value. So we can add something before. Say we want to do a little label saying maybe this is an existing circuit. And then you can also do something uh, as a, a, a suffix. So if you want to actually do that at the end, you could put that at the end. So you have the option to add uh, text to the beginning or to the end of the circuit. We also have the replacement. This will just totally get rid of what's there and just put in whatever text you happen to type in. So if you want to override what's happening from the instance in the family, you can just use the, the description replacement. Then we have include the room name in the description. You can turn that at the project level on or off. And then for each circuit, you can turn it on or off. We will pull the spaces from your model and include those rooms in the circuit description. All right, now it's set to yes. We could say no, and it'll turn those off. Uh, it is a little bit tricky with a linked uh, architectural model to get those names in properly. If you go to uh, our knowledge base, um, if you're watching a recording, this will be linked down below the video. Uh, yeah, there's a linked Revit model, room names, and circuit description. So if your room names aren't showing up, you probably have a linked Revit model and you have to do a little bit of work so that Revit can actually find the circuit, the, the room names. Because we basically go to the device and we say, hey, Revit, what room is this device in? And then Revit tells us. But it only tells us if that Revit model is properly put together. So uh, this knowledge base article walks you through the steps. Uh, it's a couple of different things. You have to link the room uh, and then you have to generate some spaces and then import those spaces and then there's a bunch of troubleshooting steps because it can all go wrong very, very easily. Uh, so this is a case where we're really asking Revit to do the heavy lifting and we're depending on Revit being configured properly in order for us to get that information. So if it's not pulling your room names, this is what you need to go get set up properly. You can also change your descriptions over here. So if you just wanna go through and, and make a bunch of changes, you can kind of do it in this list of all of your circuits rather than doing it over here. If you add some information to the beginning or end, it'll show up in the prefix. So it'll kind of figure out that you meant for that to be a prefix. Uh, if you just start adding random stuff, it'll do a replacement and, and fill in the replacement. So you, you type in here and then it'll fill in over here what it thinks you intended to do. Uh, and so if it gets it wrong, you can go over here and modify it. So if you didn't actually want that, you can get rid of it there and say, this is what I meant, and make your adjustment that way. So that is how we handle circuit descriptions. That is it for the circuit edit command. Are there any other questions on how that works or anything related to Design Master Electrical? Thank you for watching today's Design Master training. Contact us with questions or comments by calling 866-516-9497 or emailing support at designmaster.biz.